I read about a woman who telephoned a friend and asked how she was feeling. Terrible came the reply over the phone. My head is splitting. My back and legs are killing me. The house is a mess. And the kids are simply driving me crazy. Very sympathetically, the caller said, listen, go and lie down. I'll come over right away, cook lunch for you, clean your house, and take care of the children while you get some rest. By the way, how is your husband Sam? Sam, the complaining housewife, grass. My husband's name isn't Sam. Oh dear, exclaimed the first woman, I must have dialed the wrong number. There was a long pause. Does that mean you're not going to come over? <laughs> that housewife had hoped she found a friend. Someone who would be there in her need. Friendship is a powerful thing. Now growing up, I remember how important it was to me to have friends. Now, I didn't have many, but the ones that I had, I cherish deeply. According to one study that I read recently, people 25 and younger list friends as their most critical social network. Church rank fifth. By contrast, adults rank church as their key social group, followed by their work relationships. Friendship is a powerful thing, and the Bible agrees. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend love at all times. Proverbs 18, 24, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs 27, 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted. Proverbs 27, 10, do not forsake your friends and the friends of your father. Friendship is a very powerful thing. That is why it's no surprise that one of the most popular feature on Facebook is friendship. Just in case someone might not know what Facebook is, it's the most popular social get-together place on the internet. There are over 400 million users. If they had their own country, it would be the third largest nation in the world. Facebook is a place where people can share their lives. They can talk with others, post pictures and articles that they like people to see. And most of this sharing is done between friends. Now friends on Facebook are people you have given the privilege of being able to visit your Facebook page, to see your pictures and to share your thoughts. If I write something on my Facebook page, my friends will be able to read it on theirs. Now, if you're not a friend of mine on Facebook, you might not be able to share in those things. So when someone invites you to be their friend on Facebook, they are inviting you to share in their lives on the internet. That makes friendship on this site something of an honor. The average Facebook user has about 150 friends. But there are many on the internet that can have hundreds, even thousands of friends. Some have as many as 30,000 friends who get access to their page. Now, I've got about 696 friends on Facebook. But there is an odd thing about these friends. They're not all what I would call friends. Many of these are people I respect, 
people I like or would like to get to know. Or they are people who like what I have said or what I have stood for. But very few of them are what I would call my actual friends. Now, if you can't read the caption on this, it says, Hi, we're your friends from Facebook, and we thought we might pop in for a drink. That's not going to happen. I'm never going to see all those Facebook friends I have in person. Ever. If I were sick and in the hospital, they wouldn't come visit me. If I needed some money to help pay a bill, they wouldn't be there for me. If I was stranded on the highway at night, they wouldn't come pick me up. <clears throat> like that lady in our opening illustration, they're not coming over. They don't really know me. They don't know the details of my life. They don't know what I struggle with. They might not even like me, but on Facebook, they're my friends. But for the most part, they are just passing acquaintances. Most of them are very nice people, but they're not really my friends. And that's what happens in real life, too. Sometimes even the people we call our friends are not really our friends. They are not there when we need them. They disappoint us or forget us or ignore us. Jesus tells the story of the youngest son of a wealthy man. The boy didn't want to wait till his father died to get his inheritance. So he bugged him till his father finally gave in to him. Then he went far away to a faraway city and lived it up. He had parties, he had friends, at least until the money ran out. Then his friends ran out. And didn't come back. And I've talked to people who use their money to buy their friends. It works for a while, and then they were gone. I read a blog where people had shared what worried them, and a woman posted, Are my friends really my friends? Because she had learned that too often, the people she thought she could count on, she couldn't. In the midst of this troubling reality, the reality is that we don't always have true friends that we can count on. Jesus tells us we want to be, that he wants to be our friend. Now, this is a bit odd. When you consider the fact that we didn't make the first move. We did send a friend request to Jesus. He sent one to us. In John 15, 16, Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. <clears throat> and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. John tells us much the same thing in 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. Jesus reached out to us first. Now why is that so important? Well, because frankly... If most people knew what you and I really like, they wouldn't accept our friend request 
from either you or I. If people knew some of the things that we said, done, or thought, they wouldn't have anything to do with us. But Jesus knows exactly what we're like. And he still wants us as his friend. As Romans 5.10 puts it, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says it this way. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. We were enemies. We were dead in our sins and messed up lives. We weren't worth much to God or anyone else. But it was then when we were enemies of God, dead in our sins, that God sent us His friend request. Paraphrasing John 3, 16, you can say it like this. For God so loved you and I, see, He sent us a very special friend request. Or as it really says, for God so loved the world that he gave, sent, his only begotten son. Now, the way you become a friend on Facebook is, one person sends out an invitation to someone, someone else to be their friend. The other person can either Confirm them as a friend or ignore them. What Jesus is telling us here is, I invited you to be my friend. You didn't invite me. John 15, 16. You did not choose me. I chose you. Now, why is that important? Well, I've met people that act like the church should be honored that they are members of that congregation. They are important people. You should feel privileged that they are honoring you with their presence. Obviously, they didn't get the memo. They don't seem to understand that they didn't invite Jesus to be their friend. He invited them. God didn't get their invitation. And then pull Gabriel aside and say, Did you see this? Jeff sent me an invitation to be his friend. That's great. I am so honored that he wanted me as his friend. No, that's not the way it works, is it? You see, if you think God got your invitation to be your friend, then he should be the one to feel honored and privileged. You thought he was worthy of your time, but if we realize that he invites us to be his friends, that he reached out to us because we weren't worthy to reach out to him, then it is we who should be humbled that he thought we were worthy of his time. A person who is filled with pride and acts like the church should be honored that they're around didn't get the memo. They don't understand this, and as a result, they act like God and everyone else needs to bow down to them. Now, unlike Facebook, where most of my friends aren't really my friends, not only is Jesus my friend, but my friendship with Jesus improves my friendship with others. You see, in this world, earthly friends 
will disappoint me. And sometimes I might disappoint you too. Why? Because frankly, people are kind of selfish. It's not normal for people to think of others first. It's not normal for people to worry about others' problems when they have got problems of their own. It comes down to a question of who scratches whose back. Now, naturally, you prefer that it's your back being scratched. Why? Because people are inherently selfish. We tend to think of ourselves first. So Jesus said, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. It's re a repeated command over and over again throughout the scripture. Why repeat such a command? Because it doesn't come naturally to us. We don't really know how to love until we've learned the love of Jesus in our lives. <clears throat> how did Jesus love us? Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You see, God isn't concerned with how many friends you have. He's concerned with how many people to whom you were a friend. How many people you and I laid down our lives for because God knows that in this world, people can be lousy friends because they are all selfish. They all look after their own interests first. But Jesus set us the example of putting others first. He laid down his life for us so that we could live. I once read a story of a high school freshman who had a big weekend planned. He was going to a party with some friends and then go to the football game. He said, I saw a kid from my class walking home from school. His name was Kyle. It looked like he was carrying all of his books home. I thought to myself, why would anyone bring home all his books on a Friday? He must be a, really be a nerd. About that moment, a bunch of kids came running down the sidewalk and they ran at Kyle, knocking the books out of his arms, tripping him so that he landed in the dirt. His glasses went flying, landed in the grass about 10 feet from him. He looked up and I saw this terrible sadness in his eyes. My heart went out to him. So I jogged over to him and as he crawled around looking for his glasses, I saw a tear in his eye. As I handed him his glasses, I said, those guys are jerks. They really should get a lot. He looked at me and said, hey, thanks. There was a big smile on his face. He found out that Kyle didn't live that far from him, so he helped him carry his books home and invited him to join his friends this weekend. The more Kyle was around, the more he realized how likable this kid was. And his friends thought so too. Over the next four years, they became close friends. And when they became seniors, they began to think about college. Kyle decided he was going to Georgetown. And the other was going to Duke. He said, I knew that we would always be friends, that the miles would never be a problem. 
he was going to be a doctor and I was going to be a, going for business on a football scholarship. Over those years, he said, Kyle filled out and actually looked good in glasses. He had more dates than I had, and all the girls loved him. Boy, sometimes I was jealous. Graduation came, and Kyle was the valedictorian. As Kyle approached the podium to give his valedictorian speech, he cleared his throat and began. Graduation is a time to thank those who help you make it through those tough years. Your parents, your teachers, your siblings, maybe a coach, but mostly your friends. I am here to tell all of you that being a friend to someone is the best gift you can give them. I am going to tell you a story. He then related how, as a freshman, he decided that life wasn't worth living. He had planned that on a particular weekend, he was going to commit suicide. And he had cleared out his locker to take home his possessions so his mother wouldn't have to go do it later. Thankfully, I was saved, Kyle said. My friend saved me from doing the unspeakable. It was just a simple act of kindness. And that small act developed into a friendship. That friendship models for us why Jesus put such an emphasis on friendship in his ministry. Friendship is the framework for his church. And it's, a power, it's the power of our ministry for him. And it also emphasizes the value friendship can have on saving others from death. In the story I just related, Kyle was saved from taking his life. Now at this church we believe that for someone to commit suicide would be a true sad tragedy. But we also believe that it would be an even greater tragedy if someone we cared about died without Christ. Facing eternity without God. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Romans 5, 7, and 8 puts it this way. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What Jesus did was... <clears throat> He has died for our sins so that we might become his friends. He has sent you a request to be his friend. If you haven't become a Christian yet, then the question is this. Will you accept his offer or will you ignore it today? May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.